Good evening. Thank you all so very much for coming. Um, here's what we're going to do tonight. It's a very simple format. Uh, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation by Carrie Parcell, who is the Solid Waste Reduction Coordinator for Cape Cod Cooperative Extension, Barnstable County, Mass DEP, <laughs> yes. and Josh Pelletier, who is our transfer station uh, foreman. And we're, they're going to go for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then after that, we're going to have a question and answer period. Um, please hold your questions till then. If you think you might forget your question, there's index cards and pencils in the back table there. Um, that's really just about it. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I did want to mention with town meeting coming up, we've got three issues we'd like you to consider voting for. The um, reusable water bottle filling stations that Chatham Recycles is promoting, the plastic bottle ban which Sustainable Practices is promoting, and Bill Bystrom and Friends <laughs> project, which is the Styrofoam ban. So please consider voting for those. Um, and now, uh, Selectman Corey Metters, who has encouraged this, pro this uh, event tonight, is just going to say a quick hello. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to appreciate everyone for coming this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who put this forum together, and I hope it's a uh, good Q&A session. A um, lot of uh, discussion about the transfer station, recycling, et cetera, et cetera. There are clearly many layers to the discussion and uh, a lot of questions that can be answered. And I hope after this session we all leave with a better understanding of <coughs> what we're doing, why we're doing it, and where we can go from, from here. So thank you very much, and I appreciate you guys putting this together tonight. So. <coughs> Um, hi, how are you guys? Thank you for coming. Thank you for caring, which is super important. Uh, our markets are really confusing right now as if it hadn't been confusing enough. Um, so uh, as Paulette said, I'm Carrie Parcell. I work for Mass EP Barnesville County. My district is Cape and Islands. So um, I assist municipalities, uh, residential programs, as well as some nonprofits, regional and uh, other organizations and work with the solid waste recycling committees on um, building up recycling programs, coming up with innovative and new ideas like our latex paint and our PGA class processing, which I'll get into a little bit. So um, do your part, Recycle Smart is actually a slogan that Mass DEP came up with uh, in August of 2018. Um, so I thought it was kind of quickie and fun and you can remember it. So I borrowed it from them. Uh, so tonight I want to talk about kind of like the state of the Cape. So it's kind of a broad sense of what's going on in the Cape as well as globally and then sort of how uh, the global markets affect us locally and I'm going to give you some tips and pointers on how to recycle in general and then Josh is here to be able to answer questions specific to the Chatham transfer station because we all know that the 15 towns of Barnesville County likes to do everything differently than each other. Yeah. So you guys need to know how Chatham does it specifically because I guarantee you if you were going to sandwich to, uh, you know, to Provincetown, they're all gonna do it a different way with the same materials and that's what makes it so confusing. So um, how, how many of you guys have been to the hazardous waste events here on the Cape? Show of hands, don't be shy. Good, do you go every year? That means your spending habits are bad. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, no, we're, we're good. Stuff I've saved for years. <laughs> right? You just you keep finding it in the basement, in the garage, in the sheds. So Calliope hosts our hazardous waste. And uh, in the first year that I was here, I actually toured a um, latex paint recycling facility. And they used to be called the Paint Exchange. They're now known as Recolor. And they relocated from Rockland to Hanover. And um, I solicited my towns. I got 15 of them together. Tom Temple was there at that meeting. And the town of Bourne stepped up and said that they would write the grant on behalf of all 15 towns. They were awarded about $82,000 for a two-year grant. So now we collect your latex paint only. Um, we were doing it in conjunction with hazardous waste. That's why I asked if you had been to those events. Now it's just latex only. So if you visit the Bourne Town <coughs> website, you can find that paint recycling program. Uh, the only thing you can't recycle with paint is anything that's clumpy, old, it's got some debris in it, um, it's been frozen over, so it's got like that skin. Uh, but otherwise, it's highly recyclable. Uh, the town of Orleans uh, bought all that, not all of it, but a bunch of it to uh, paint their DPW building that they just built. Uh, my boss at DEP bought a whole bunch of paint to paint her house. So it's really cool, it's less expensive than brand new paint, and you're recycling. So it's paint used on the cape, bought on the cape, recycled on the cape, and then reused, so it's full circle recycling. If I'm talking too fast, please let me know. I tend to just like, 
go through everything because I have like a time limit and I could talk about this for 10 years straight. Um, so I will slow down. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, PGA is process glass aggregate, so it's a construction material. So you take glass, your bottle bill glass and other types of glass like a pickle jar, and you can actually process it into a 3 8 minus for construction. And then that material can be used as a road base as well as in building, highway, construction, and drainage projects. So again, uh, we had a glass problem uh, about a year ago. Our one and only facility in the state of Mass closed down. Uh, so glass went in a huge crisis. Um, it was costing anywhere from 20 to maybe $40 a ton to get rid of a little while ago. And I saw it as high as 162 at one point. Um, so DEP put a grant out there, the town of Dennis, um, went for it, they were awarded, and now any town that source separates their glass can actually tip it at the town of Dennis, it's gonna get processed, and then that material can be used as construction, material, uh, as construction uh, here on the Cape. Um, the town of Yarmouth had, uh, has grants for an anaerobic digester, which uh, processes food waste as well as uh, wastewater sludge, so it's that slurry stuff that comes out from wastewater treatment facilities, um, and they can process that for energy. So that's a way of recycling and composting. Um, food waste drop-off collections. There are eight towns in Barnesville County that collect food waste at the transfer station. Chatham was the first to do it. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Municipal waste bans, those are things like your classic bag bans, polystyrene <coughs> bans, bans on straws, balloons, um, other things that towns look at individually and think that it's not a good idea. Um, they can uh, municipally work on some bans or things with um, individual um, water bottles going around right now. And then this year, it's not new, but the extent of the boat shrink wrap uh, recycling has actually expanded. So this was um, Woods Hole Sea Grant approached me, and then I went to see Mass Cobanta for some funding. Sea Grant funds it. Then I went to the AmeriCorps to get some volunteers, and then I made a big melting pot of connections. And now you can actually take your boat shrink wrap to the town of uh, Bourne, the town of Dennis, and the town of Eastham through June 30th. Um, and you can visit our website or just Google uh, boat shrink wrap and find that information. So those are kind of the things that are happening right now. These are the bigger regional projects. They work on a lot of really small end, singular, you know, municipal only projects. But these are some of the things that we're working on. So these are our plastic bag bans. So there's only two towns currently on the Cape that do not have a ban on plastic bags. Um, and both of them are working on it currently. Uh, polystyrene, I believe there's five towns that have passed it. And the ones that say no town meeting, it just means it's up for town meeting sometime this spring or fall. Um, so they're looking at that. And poly does anybody know what polystyrene is? Good, great. I don't want to say words that you don't know. All right. so. Uh, a while back, we had this huge thing called the National Sword. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that term before. One person, two, two, three, all right, great. So the National Sword came from the Chinese government because the Chinese historically, especially over the past 30 years, has been taking our recycling. Unfortunately, our recycling was basically trash with recyclables in it. So it was more of a quanti uh, quantity over a quality when we were shipping it to port and China was accepting it. So when you have 73.1% import and then they were exporting about 20, 26.9%, about 30%, this is globally, this is not the figures for the United States exclusively, this is just sort of a number that China was historically taking up until about a year and a half, two years ago. So what happened was with the national sword, is the Chinese government started to, started to decipher the fact that we really weren't sending them recyclables. We were sending them trash with recycling in it. So I'll explain how our recycling is sort of um, processed here within um, the state so that helps you kind of better understand and think ahead when you're putting things into your bin or when you're going to a drop-off center about how to sort of articulate within yourself, do I toss this into the bin or do I toss this in the trash and I can give you some measurements and some ideas on, on thinking about that, as well as some, um, some resources to access that. So, um, so that's kind of this next little piece is the National Sword and the challenges. And then I'm going to kind of break down how we recycle. And then, again, Josh is here to really talk to you about your specific questions about what you can do here in Chatham. Um, because, again, Chatham is going to be totally different than when you go to the town of Sandwich or if you go all the way down to Provincetown or if you're in Falmouth where it's a curbside community and everything just goes into your bin at the curb to be collected by a hauler.
Um, so this is a lot of words, and I usually don't do things very wordy in PowerPoints, but basically the breakdown is, is um, back in 2013, the Chinese government gave us a false threat called the Green Fence. And basically it was telling us, look, you're sending us trash with recycling in it, not recycling with trash in it. And there's a threshold, so I want you to sort of think about, I, I'm usually very animated because I'm not stuck behind a podium, but um, if you think about a recycling bin, and you have your pickle jars that are cleaned out, your, you know, your peanut butter, some crushed up Amazon boxes, some single use plastic water bottles, you've got some junk mail, some mixed paper, you've got your newspapers, and it's all in this bin, and you go and you set it out on the curb. That's a really nice looking recycling bin that's nice and clean and not contaminated. So your neighbor goes by and they huck their bag of trash in there and some baby diapers and some Christmas lights and some Barbie dolls and whatever else that goes in there that doesn't belong in there. And now the threshold from recyclables in there is now trash. So that load is now trash with recycling in it and that would explain why some of your recycling actually goes into the landfill. It's because we can't sort that anymore. There's a threshold. Once you've contaminated it too highly, that tin of re or that bin of recycling is now trash. Does that kind of explain why there's this theory that recycling goes into our landfills into the it happens, but that's because we're not recycling right. Okay? So kind of fast forward, there was this false sort of, you know, whatever in 2013, and then 2015, there was more of this like enforcements and checks and stuff at the ports in China. And they were kind of giving us fees and giving the global markets, you know, warnings and taps on the hand. And then finally they got tired of it. In January of 2018, they said no more. And they brought the threshold of contamination and recyclings, i.e. the trash that's in the recycling and what's bailed and exported to China at less than three of 1%. That is an absolute possible or impossible rate for any sorting facility, whether or not it's high tech or has equipment 20 years old. It's an impossible threshold. So if you think what happened is, here's all of our stuff in China, the Chinese government says stop doing it. So it stops. Everything stops at the port. And that trickled down to the states, in the, into the countries, to the states, to the haulers, to the municipalities, to the curbside people, to the drop-offs, to the residents. Okay? So it was just like backlog, backlog, backlog. And the markets crash. They don't want our plastic. They don't want our low-grade scrap metal. They don't want our glass. They don't want um, our mixed paper. They don't want our fibers. They don't want any of the stuff that we were sending them because it was all just trash with a few recyclables mixed in. So they were like, no more. So I think bottlenecked. It got really expensive. It got really confusing. And we really had to sort of go, how do we fix this? How are we responding? Does anybody know about the waistbands here in Massachusetts? One person, two. So, I've got my bottle of wine at the end of the evening. I finished it off, and I throw it in the trash can. Technically, that's illegal, because glass does not belong in your trash can. That is not municipal solid waste. That is recycling. Same thing with my Amazon box. Crush it up, don't have recycling, huck it in my trash can. Nobody's gonna come knocking at your door and arrest you. However, that's illegal, and that's what happens sometimes with our recyclables. Same thing happens with our recycling bin. We put things in there that don't belong, and that's where the contamination comes from. So we have these material recovery facilities here in the state. There's nine of them. And what they do is, this is literally one of the first steps that our recyclables go through, is a series of folks through a conveyor belt. Has anybody heard of a tipping fee or a tipping floor? Okay, cool. So basically that comes from when you're tipping your trash recycling onto a floor, to be sorted or pushed into, you know, like they do in the town of Chatham into that building to be removed later. Um, I'm presuming there's like compactors there that it all kind of goes into, or I don't know what you do. But. Um, you usually use a front end loader and push into the trailer for garbage. Push it into the trailer to get shipped out. Okay. So they're called, we call them MRFs, but they're material recovery facilities. And these are the guys here in the state that sort of recycling, whether it's single stream, dual stream, completely source separated. Um, whatever. Uh, Chatham is source separated. They separate everything from your newspaper to your cardboard to the colors of your glass to uh, plastics. Yeah, One through seven go in the same yeah, bin, though, right? Cardboard, plastics, mixed paper, newspaper, tin Great. cans, metal. Okay. So again, if I'm in, and I'm referencing which a lot because I lived there for a few years, so I'm familiar with their transfer station. 
they have one compactor for glass, tin, and plastics, and another compactor for anything paper, mixed, cardboard, or newspaper, and that's how they do it. And then they have the compactors for your trash and the blue bags they are pays you throw community. So that's basically it. And then they have their bulky pay-to items, like your mattresses, your, wet, uh, your white goods, um, which are you know your washers and dryers, your air conditioners, stoves, stuff like that. Um, so we, I talked a little bit about the waste bands. They began in 1990. Uh, the first material banned from the solid waste uh, was mercury, and that is because it's a hazardous material. Um, but the reason why, outside of that, where they were looking to recover some very valuable materials, because recyclables traditionally in clean streams have some sort of value. Um, and towns, municipalities, haulers alike, and these sorting facilities make money off of these clean streams by selling it, by, by processing it and preparing it to send to vendors that actually use it towards the recycled materials. Does anybody know what a textile is? Okay, we're wearing them. Textiles are clothing, sheets, towels, blankets. So as long as they're not soiled or wet or moldy or anything like that, you can recycle textiles. You do not put them in your bin. Here's why. When you go to a sorting facility, those folks there, conveyor belts and there's blowers and optics and lighting and all this stuff. So if you think about something like your clothing or a bath sheet or a, you know, a towel or whatever going through there, um, it's going to tangle up in the equipment and then they have to stop the equipment and actually send human hands in there. Worker safety, we want them to go home at the end of the night like the rest of us do, right? So they have to go in, stop the equipment and untangle it. So, but if you have textiles in a nice clean stream, they can actually shred it up and reuse it in the upholstery in your chairs and your dashboards and in the side panels of your vehicles and all different things that, that the textiles go into. It also saves our energy and it reduces the capacity for, and the need for landfills, things like that. So if we're diverting all of these materials away from waste energy facilities as well as, well as the landfills, you're saving a lot of capacity um, and you're reducing your waste. So these are just some of the waste bands since 1990, things like um, white goods, which again are appliances, things like your stoves, washers, your dryers, your air conditioners, things like that. You know, your basic recycling, your cardboard, your tin, your plastic, your glass, um, newspaper, single resin narrow neck plastic bottles, those are your PET number one single use water bottles, uh, Gatorade bottles, stuff like that. Um, your uh, catheter ray tubes, does anybody know what that is? Those are your TVs. Remember the big old tube TVs and the computer monitors that it took 14 people to carry? Oh yeah, those were cool. You just didn't move them. You put a TV on top of the one working TV. Um, so now that you kind of know how we recycle, let's kind of talk about a few of the recycling materials and let's try to guess why they wouldn't go into your bin, but might go somewhere else to be recycled in a different way. Okay, you guys ready? You're so not excited right now. Did everybody have dinner? <laughs> this is my favorite topic in the world and you're all like falling asleep on me. Just kidding. So, think of a plastic bag. Where does that plastic bag go when you go to the transfer station? They don't, they don't take them here. You take it to the grocery store. Yeah, right. If they go to Stop and Shop, as well as plastic film, or the plastic that goes around your toilet paper rolls, or your paper towel rolls, or the sleeves for your newspaper, or the sleeves in the produce, if you take those in a nice clean stream without food in there, without anything else mixed in, and you go to your Stop and Shop, that will get recycled into all weather deck. If you take it to your transfer station and you put it in with the plastics, it's going to muck up that MRF, and it's going to have to stop production and equipment and processing and they're gonna to have to send somebody in there to unclog the equipment, okay? So does that make plastic bags recyclable, yes or no? Yes. Yes. But you have to do it not in your bin, right? But how come, now you're, I hate to interrupt. No, you're not, ask questions. Later. later. Okay, later. 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 Okay. Oh, so okay, I'll remember you. Just remember your right. question of grouting plastic bags. Um, so we already talked about textiles. The other thing is, so if you have a Gatorade bottle or a single-use plastic water bottle, do you put the cap on? Do now. Yeah, we do. Yep. Oh, no. yep. You can. If you don't, what do you think happens to the cap? Gets tossed. It gets tossed. The reason why is even if you put it in the bin without it being reattached to the, uh, the plastic bottle, it is under two inches in diameter 
And if we think about anything less than two inches in diameter going through those bins and into the compactors and things like that at the transfer station, once it gets to the sorting facility, it falls through the equipment and it becomes resin or outbound or residue. So it becomes trash on their sorting floor because it just doesn't process through the equipment. So you, have you ever seen those little teeny tiny post-it notes that are like, you know, like maybe like a, you know, like a little baby ones? Those are actually trash because it's not going to go in your recycling bin and get sorted the way a regular piece of office paper would or, you know, a chunky piece of junk mail or your newspaper. So that would be trash. Um, how about plastic utensils and straws? Straws are paper. They go well, they're paper straws, but they're plastic straws. Plastic straws and plastic reusable utensils. That is trash. That is trash. If you put it in your bin, you're contaminating it. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but when it gets to the sorting facilities, it falls through all the equipment anyway and lands on the floor. Right? So it just it's trash. So if you're getting takeout and you have those things or you use straws or whatever, those are the type of things that are just going to fall through the sorting equipment here in the state of Massachusetts, so that is trash. So, again, responding to the National Sword, and how do we get the word out that we were kind of doing it wrong for a really long time? Because, again, they were allowing quantity over quality. Now all they want is quality. No more recyclables that are trash, okay? So Recycle Smart MA is a website that MassDEP put together, and it's actually really neat, and it's sort of integrate. Um, it's it's user friendly, and when you go to this website, at, on their homepage, there's a widget, and a widget is this little bar that we call a recyclopedia, and you can type in a question saying to yourself, "Hmm, is my Dunkin' Donuts coffee cup recyclable?" You type it in, and it'll tell you what to do with it. Put it in the bin, put it in the trash. Or if it doesn't belong in your recycling bin or the trash, like a textile, what about my sweater? It'll tell you to take it to a textile bin. The town of Chatham has textile bins. Same with book bins and you guys have like uh, e-waste bins and yeah. all that other good stuff. So it's recyclable, but not in your bin or not in those basic recycling compactors and collection containers in the recycling center of the transfer station. There's a special place for each thing. So this is also what we call an infographic. It's a RecycleSmart infographic. If you scroll down on that page on RecycleSmartMA.com, this infographic is there and you can download a printable version and it comes out kind of like a large cue card. And it's meant to be that size so you can tape it to your refrigerator or put it on the side of a cabinet. You can tape it to your recycling bin. But it basically tells you what they'll accept and what not to put. And this is for your bin, your basic recycling. So as you can see, the do not bag, here recyclables, no garbage, no food or liquid. The almighty pizza box with the pizza leftover in there. So the pizza box is okay. A little bit of grease is okay. No pizza is okay. We call that yuck. Okay, so it's yucky. Um, clothing and linens are textiles. Tanglers are also um, things like the Christmas lights and the coat hangers and the way I think of a tangler kind of is if something is going to get tangled in equipment or something you wouldn't want to run over with your lawnmower. Okay? Tangles up, screws everything up. Um, so it's kind of a nice infographic. Uh, there's eight contaminants that we really, really see in the recycling bin that are in some cases recyclable, just not in that way that we're describing at the curb, or um, in specific containers that you would throw, um, you would dispose of your recycling in at the Chatham Transfer Station. So the plastic bags is the number one thing. It's so confusing. It's plastic. It has the symbol on it. It says recyclable. It is, but as we talked about earlier, it's recyclable in a different stream somewhere other than the Tratum transfer station. If you bring it to the transfer station, kindly put it into the solid waste bin and not your recycling bin where the rest of the plastics are. Food waste? Chatham was the first on the Cape to have food waste collection at the transfer station. So if you so choose, you can have a little tabletop toter at your house and carry it to the transfer station. Instead of putting it in the trash, you can compost it. Um, and there's a compost guy that comes and picks it up and will turn it into compost and bring it back to the transfer station for you guys to purchase for your gardens. Uh, loose shredded paper, we kind of talked about this with Josh. So typically that wouldn't go into a single stream bin and a lot of places won't take it in with their mixed paper. Chatham does. Right? Yes. Yes. So see, even I have to be like, what do you guys do with this material? 
Um, some of the beverage cartons uh, we call wrong plastics. Uh, so like a bulky rigid plastic, like a number six or seven, those heavy duty, thick, thick, thick plastics. Those aren't really kind to the recycling. Not all plastics are created equal. Obviously you don't want hazardous waste in your recycling. You don't want mercury or anything like that in there. There's some frozen food containers as well as unrinsed glass containers. Um, I like pickles and I drink the pickle juice, so my jar is always empty. <laughs> so, I am this excited when I learn what's recyclable, because then I can do my part and recycle. Smart, you're smart. <laughs> oh my god, you sure? We should have brought some like Red Bull. Get your wings. Red Bull, get your wings. Okay, so the top 10 are the things that we kind of talked about. Your glass, your plastics, your aluminum, your tin, those sorts of things. Um, there's also recyclable, your plastic bags that we talked about, textiles that just don't go in the bin, um, books, things like that, video, media. Um, so I know this image is really teeny tiny. I'm sorry, I got it off of the EPA website, as well as Keep America Beautiful and SWANA um, website, so you can always look and find that there. But I really do get this excited when I'm like, yay! Um, this is another thing that Mass DEP did. It's called the Recycling IQ Kit. It is in its third year, the town of Chatham. One of the first towns to do it. Right? You guys are good. You guys are all poking and prodding, writing letters to the transfer station telling Josh what to do, right? So IQ, does anybody have an idea of what that could stand for? Increased quality. Okay, so we want to increase the quality of the recycling, not the quantity of your recycling. And we want to reduce that all word I've been saying a million times over, contamination. Okay, because we don't want trash with recycling in it, and we don't want recycling with trash in it. Okay, nice and clean. So this was one of their um, slogans uh, that they put up all over the transfer station. How many of you guys use the transfer station? Okay. Um, so you all have at least seen this sign. I'm so sorry. I guess you remember that 90s song? No? Okay. I used to dance to it in fourth grade. Okay. So basically we want to remember to think before you toss. So there used to be kind of this mantra of, you know, with in doubt, put it in your bin. Someone else will sort it out. It's kind of true, but not so much anymore. If I have a plastic bag and I have these beautiful recycling in it and it wounds up at that MRF, the first thing those sorting people are going to do, right under the sorting floor. It doesn't matter how pristine that bag full of recycling is, they don't have time to be opening bags. It's just gone. It's gone. So within doubt, throw it out or go to RecycleSmartMA.org or you can call me. I brought my business cards. I've ordered more. <laughs> okay, so before we get to your questions with Josh, and you can ask me broad scale questions, or you can ask specific questions towards the, tra the Chatham Transfer Station, it looks like most of you do use. Um, I do know a lot of uh, curbside strategies, not all, um, but I, I do work with private haulers to some degree, and I talk to them, and they're all very sweet to me, even though I'm a municipal person mostly. Um, but I do get um, a lot of calls and conversations from the private haulers as well because they're just as integral in, in helping us at the curb uh, when it's getting picked up um, at the end of the sidewalk. Um, so Global Markets, this was sort of uh, Brooke Nash. She is the department chief for DEP. So I work for, I, I'm weird, uh, I work for the state and the county, but I'm employed by the county, but the state pays most of my bill. So. Uh, Brooke Nash is the boss on that side of my, <coughs> my, my work, and she did a speech, uh, not a speech, she sort of had these closing marks about markets and how they're affecting us locally, and these are just some of what I thought were some of her best talking points and really, really nice takeaways. Um, so, uh, you know, every, uh, uh, recycling is a commodity, like anything else, and, and it's a commodity that we can't control what the value is, it's sort of this global thing based on supply and demand and need and what we're producing and overproducing and you know when the glass market, the one and only processor in Massachusetts closed down, I mean that was a crisis, what do you do with it? 
you know, and we responded to that, to that by having a grant available for the town of Dennis for the towns that do source separate their glass um, outside of any other material stream uh, to take. And so, you know, we, we look at that. Um, but as a, as a commodity, there are either costs or revenues. You know, it's like playing the stock market, and that's a lot of what transfer station employees do is look at the metal, look at the plastic, look at the newspaper, look at the cardboard. How much am I going to make? How much am I not going to make? What's this load going to cost me? What's this load going to get me? Um, and so, you know, they, they kind of get to play the markets. Everywhere. That's all Josh does. It's like a video game. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's busy recycling, too. Um, so, you know, the market fluctuations, and, and we really need to look at these long-term strategies. Uh, you know, January of 2018 really, really put us in a huge bind and made things really expensive. And, you know, not only is, you know, the United States in general feeling it, you know, state by state, and, you know, depending on how they're doing it and their markets, and, you know, we're right up there with California. The EPA is here. You know, our standards are way, way up here, so we're already doing a lot better in that regard. But when they start looking at us and talking about money and funding and everything else, we're held at that standard as our minimum. So we can't just drop it and say, oh, we're still above the EPA. It's like, no, Massachusetts, you've been up here for quite a while. So it's a little different, you know. I'm not saying game low, you game high, but. Um, and then recognizing the market conditions. So they really have local consequences because of that global impact that it had. It's really affected us. We, I mean, we're all here because we don't know if we're doing it right. You know, we assume we are. I, I think some of the worst words that I ever hear out of somebody's mouth is, I recycle everything. Cringe. <laughs> Ugh. Because they're putting their paper towels in there. No. I mean, if you want to, you can compost them. But don't put them in your recycling. No plastic utensils. No Christmas lights you can recycle at your transfer station, too. But that's separate. Because it goes to a scrap metal guy to be stripped. Okay? If it winds up at the MRF, it just, what does it do? What does it do? Come on. I said it four times. Tangles everything, right? It's a tangler. Um, so, you know, when, when we're looking at these things and we're doing grants and we're setting up programs and we're setting up municipalities for help and there are business development grants and things like that for uh, the private side, the curbside side, um, if the curbside isn't run by a municipality, uh, like the town of Bourne and the town of Falmouth and the town of Provincetown, although all three of those municipalities do have drop-offs in conjunction to the municipal curbside. Um, so the big thing is, is with us, and this is just in the state, is um, our industry and what we do supports about 2,000 businesses statewide, and we employ about 14,000 people. And that includes Josh and I in this type of thing. Um, and the alternative would really be is just disposing of these high-value commodities into our landfills and into the waste energy facilities. So in closing, by Brooke Nash, um, so, in the long term, our communities, economy, and environment reap huge rewards by saving natural resources, increasing energy efficiency, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions that come from recycling. There's me in Boston Common. Let's try to wake you guys up. Yeah. Do you want to see? Um, I didn't get a chance. Nobody came back for, for index cards or pencils. I, actually, yeah, I, know, I, I think I gave it to one person. Uh, but by now, if you have questions, I'm sure you'll remember them for the next 10 seconds. Um, Carrie, thank you so very much. That's a lot of information. <laughs> you guys are going to remember all of this, right? <laughs> There'll be a short quiz. <laughs> oh, I'll quiz you the whole and, time. And now being Chatham residents, it, it would make sense for you to, of course, ask Carrie whatever you want. Josh will know specifically about Chatham things. And I just want to say one quick thing. When we talk about the bin, recycling bin, we're talking single stream. Um, Chatham Transfer Station, for people who bring their recyclables there, it's source separated. So it, it's kind of two different mm -hmm. things. So, okay. Um, what about we put our trash in a plastic bag? <laughs> what do you do with your trash if you don't put it, you know, the bags you buy in the supermarket with the red uh, yeah. strings? What do you do if you don't put it in plastic? You're going to be cleaning your trash can out a heck of a lot. Um, <laughs> because it's trash and plastic bags can't go in your trash, that's a perfectly acceptable way to get rid of your trash. Oh. Just don't put your plastic bags in the recycling. Like, Remember how we used to have those plastic bags with the handles and they blew away and wound up in our trees and our oceans at the grocery store? Those are mainly what we're talking about. Trash bags with trash in it is fine as trash. Okay. 
It's not in her second. You, if I may, you, you talked about market fluctuations. I'm sure that's very important. In Chatham, we recently separated newspapers because apparently there's more value in, in selling or transporting newspapers than in trash. But can you get more specific about the markets for, you know, what's the impact or motivation to separate, for example, plastic? Supposing you had 100 pounds of plastic and 100 pounds of trash, which costs more to dispose of? And what's the motivation, you know, economically to separate it? So I think the incentive to recycle in general is environmentally driven, but it's also economically driven. Um, so with it, plastics versus trash, um, if you have a really nice clean stream, when I say clean stream, it's its own material by itself. So if I am a recycler and the only thing I want from you is single use water bottles or Gatorade bottles or whatever single use beverage bottles you have, and they're nice and clean and nobody's giving them to me with the juice and stuff still left behind, and I have a big thing of that, that's actually a high value commodity. And the reason why is because those materials can be recycled over and over and over again into itself. Something like a Tyco toy playset in a backyard for a toddler or whatever, that would be recycled into things like, you know, your, your plastic type speed bumps. Um, it would be recycled into things like all leather decking. It would be recycled into um, like this type of stuff, this like hard plastic type stuff. So it just depends. So with newspaper, <coughs> newspaper by itself and not mixed in with cardboard and mixed paper, like your office paper and paper that you'd find at a school, has a higher value all by itself than it would mixed in with everything else. And that's why the transfer station made that move to separate it so they can make more money incoming than paying outgoing because of the way the markets are. Hi, I just have to make a point of clarification. Uh, when it comes to plastic bottles, they are not recycled into other plastic bottles. That's one of the biggest issues with the plastic industry. What's happening with plastic bottles is they are used to make materials like fabric threads and we need to use new virgin plastic to make bottles. And that's one, one aspect of this whole recycling, I think, that we need to take into consideration as well. And that's why recycling is, is, is part, of the, part of the environmental solution, but not the only one. And the primary reason is because it doesn't stop the creation of new plastics. So we also have to think to ourselves, and I think you would agree with this, because most recycling organizations do say this, to the extent that we can substitute away from single use or convenient products. It's also very important because the one element that's not captured is the emissions element. And every time we recycle, we also create adverse impacts to the environment through emissions, which could be reduced by just reducing the amount of materials. Thank you. Yeah, we call those MTCUs, metric ton carbon emissions, when we're calculating that. So like if we were to reduce this many what, we would have this many something, it's the equivalency of. So when you see those recycling stats, that's what they're basing it on. Somebody all the way in the back. Oh. Uh, mine was actually more of an observation, but it has to do with the plastic bag recycling. Um, now, Chatham now has a ban, but I moved here from Long Island um, six years ago. And when you were there, all, not only all the grocery stores, even places like CVS, they all had the bins for the plastic bag recycling. And I was amazed when I moved to Chatham and nowhere, including stores that regularly gave out plastic bags, had the recycling. And I mean, I think that probably a lot of people in this room do take the bags to Stop and Shop or Shaw's. You know, they don't put it in the household garbage, but I'm amazed how few places here yeah, it is, okay. you know, I, <laughs> I love what we're doing here and how we respond to things and the way that we're building our educational piece for recycling and, and trying to, you know, train people. I grew up in Oregon. I was doing this as a child just naturally. Like, there wasn't such a thing as, what do we do with your food waste? You took it in the backyard, you dumped it in a pile, and you used it in your gardens in the spring, period. Like, there was no other way that we did things, and we had the bottle bill back in the 70s, and... Um, my dad put the leaf and yard waste, like waste into a you know a paper bag and set it on the curb, and the truck would come and pick it up. And you know, so. But I have a job. Because all you guys are not doing it. Um, 
No, I'm kidding. That's not that important. Um, but I, yeah, I get it. And I, I've heard that from visitors and other people, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, you know, well, I don't do that at home or I'm just amazed. And, and so, yeah. There's no, there's no, like, in China, there is no place to recycle plastic bags like that. Not that I have seen because they don't have a large scale grocer now. For the food waste at the um, transfer station, are plastic, the biodegradable that are liner bags, allowed to be used or left? Mm. Can you have your food waste in that liner bag and take the whole bag and put that type of plastic in the food waste, or not even there? Yeah, we don't we don't urge um, any of the plastic to be in with that. Um, we actually have a little um, trash container that's to the right of that. So once your food waste is dumped um, into the bin, um, you can place your plastic bag to the right of that. Thank you. I was a former school teacher and, and as I'm listening I'm thinking this would be a wonderful opportunity to have the kids go and have field trips down to the dump, get some information about them, they'll spread it to their parents who probably don't have the time to figure all this out and their grandparents. And also I'm thinking of people who come in in the summertime and they're summer residents probably are not aware of our rules and regulations. And we might even run some field trips or some kind of incentive to get people to go down and find out where to put things in the right way. A lot of people take the easy way. They put a lot of stuff in the um, one barrel and get rid of it. They go, nobody's going to check it. But there's definitely a way of making people uh, more responsible for what they're throwing. I like to call that parent shaming. Uh, <laughs> when I go into the schools, I do have schools under my job description. Schools are notoriously harder to get into and talk with the students. I mean, the curriculum stuff's so jam-packed that they really don't have time for me. Um, but I have been invited into Nosset School District, Brewster, um, Sandwich, Barnstable, um, about seven or eight schools on the Cape, and I know that's just a blip of schools that are here. Um, but I do presentations and, you know, trash sorts in front of the kids where somebody brings me a trash bag and I'll put on the gloves and show them what's recyclable and what's not. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, I, I agree to a point with what Madavi said about recycling um, just being a small part of the picture, and I think we all understand the triangle is Re reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, so we're not suggesting here that recycling is the only way to address environmental problems. Reducing is, is critical to the whole thing. Yeah. I also wanted to mention that with regard to plastic bags, recyclable plastic bags also includes like the liners on your cereal boxes, your cracker boxes, um, dry cleaning bags, um, almost any plastic bag you can think of that's, that's clean and dry. Thank you. <coughs> This one's, for, this one's for Josh. All right, so in Chatham, we have our separate compactor for cardboard, compactor for plastics and newspapers and everything. <coughs> how would you grade us um, and how we're doing a recycling? I mean, are we finding, <laughs> a loaded question there. Um, are there items that you are finding are going into the mixed paper or say the cardboard that shouldn't, don't belong there that we are more Cause we are we are creating what they, I heard the term uh, contaminated loads a lot you know here and there. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? I mean, are, are there certain things that are going into the recycling area that we really and we we specifically Chatham shouldn't be doing? And and if it is, what does that do to the load? Like you got the plastic compactor, all of a sudden a bunch of glass goes in it. Mm -hmm. What's the result of something like that? Um, typically, we don't get too much glass on an occasion. A bottle may go in there. Um, you know, Chatham's actually been pretty good about it as far as that not happening. Um, but typically in that result, if we can manage to get it out of there, we will, you know, safely. Mm -hmm. The compactor has some um, safety switches which we can shut off to manage to take some of those out. We try and keep our loads um, as clean as can be. Um, you know, give or take, you know, any of you guys that come down and see us, you know, we're always fixing, you know, items if they're going in the wrong, you know, place and area and then educating as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you just touched on the mixed paper portion of it. That one I think is the one that needs the most work um, because that one there, we're finding just about everything in it. Um, so corrugated cardboard, I mean, there's a revenue there with that. So when we find that in the mixed paper, it, it turns to, you know, a non-profit versus, you know, and then mm -hmm. Along with the, um, the newspaper, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to touch on with, 
you know, in, in regards to the uh, mixed paper, only because I think the confusion is now is, you know, if you come in with your mixed paper and you have newspaper in it, it's con I don't know if it's being considered as a mixed load where we're just going to throw the whole bag in there. Um, you know, we have both containers right across from each other where, you know, it's it's easy just to put down on the table, newspaper on the, in one bin, and then obviously a mix in the other one. I just have a broader question, which is, is the state, Mass DEP, working with supermarkets to um, get them to use, th there's so much plastic, everything you buy practically in the supermarket is wrapped in plastic. Um, so has, is Mass DEP doing anything there? I mean, years ago, you used to go into a grocery store and you had, you know, salad or whatever that was, could be bagged yourself, put into a paper bag. Um, some places still have that, but for the most part, everything is in plastic. Is, so my question is, on a broader scale, going back there, which would help us get rid of some of the plastic that we have to get rid of, is Mass DEP doing anything with uh, large grocery stores, like Stop and Shop, et cetera? My department specifically doesn't really deal with legislation. Um, we're public employees, so we don't necessarily, we, we have our silent like high fives, but we don't, legis you know, we don't advocate for legislation. I mean, uh, unless we're invited to something specifically by a certain person, then you know, we go as a guest, but we don't you know, rally the troops. Um, there is a thing called Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR, for take-back programs for things like latex paint, mattresses, phone books, pharmaceuticals. Um, as far as the plastic and plastic-free aisles and stuff in the supermarkets, that's kind of a tipping point for residents and patrons and consumers who are getting tired of all the plastic, who are advocating and signing petitions and doing that sort of, you know, the, the grassroots drive towards it. So, I mean, I know folks that, you know, Charmin, for example, I guess she bought some toilet paper the other day where it was wrapped in plastic, but then each thing's wrapped individually, or they were wrapped in fours individually or something, and she was like, what's the point? So she actually wrote them, and they wrote her a nice letter back. So I, I think you have to, you know, it's, it, it's a behavior change that we have to think about what we're doing and consuming. So, you know, if, if you don't want, you know, that deli sandwich in the plastic container that's not recyclable, you know, and there's no deli option, you kind of have to make that decision right then and there whether or not that sandwich is that important to you at the time. I mean, I know I struggle with that sometimes. Like, if I don't have my Yeti with me, do I really want that cup of coffee that bad? I've had uh, talked to people at the big hall where we drop trash. And I would not confront them, I would try to educate them, why are you doing that? And you know what the answer is? I'm too damn lazy. And it's happened about four or five times with me. And I think when we have the recyclable day at, at the transfer station, we would pay to st uh, station some folks right at that area where they just dump stuff. That's where you get the education. It doesn't do any good to put people down where you have the paper or the cans, or the bottles, because they're already doing that. It's where they throw the stuff, where you have to confront them and educate them and stop them. In fact, <coughs> you ought to have a video camera up there and take our license plate. <laughs> That's all you, Josh and Tom. <laughs> Hi, my name is Susie Fishback, and first I want to thank Josh and the town for letting the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Cub Scouts use the trailer up there. And that is where the kids are learning. Um, and the parents, because we get plastic bottles, glass bottles. We've had toilet seats. We've had <laughs> hockey equipment. We one time had a plastic bottle with needles in it because somebody didn't know how to dispose of their syringes. But the kids learn where things go. And they tell people. I'm sorry, sir, if that doesn't go here, that's a water bottle that goes over there. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. It's helpful to our programs. It's helpful to you people, because you don't have to have somebody sort that. Um, two more things I want to say. 
the fellas at the dump, our dump fellas, they are so good. They to answer the most stupid questions. <laughs> because, but there are no stupid questions, because if you don't understand it, and it's always, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, it goes here. Yes, what can I do to help you? You have the best crew up there. Thank and you. our kids yeah. see that. Thank and you. they see how to treat the people. Now, everybody that goes to the dump has a dump sticker. Hello, how about we have a little video that's run I, it's time consuming for the person to get this sticker, mm. but you don't get your driver's license without learning about it. And maybe that's where to start. There could be an ongoing video at the dump. There again, somebody has to do this. It's making work for them, mm. but it's an education thing. I tried to get one of the kids to do it as their gold award or their eagle award. How about this? But it's nice to be able to have station people there but that costs money. The town has a program for people that are over 60 that works through the Council on Aging. You can work off your taxes. I don't know if the DPW, I mean, if the dump, we call it the dump, I know it's a transfer station, <laughs> but we've always called it the dump. And it, um, I don't know if that's part, if, you, if anybody in that program could stand there and tell people. I don't know. They do it? Tom? Yeah. yeah. I did it. Yeah. yeah. Those are my questions. Come and on thanks on again. Mr. DPW Director. You know, I'm Tom Temple, Director of Public Works. Uh, to answer that question, uh, we have asked for the uh, senior program to come help us out. The problem with the transfer station is during the summertime, it's, there's no shade and they're in the direct sun. And, and during the cooler winter seasons, it's really cold and the cross breezes that come, it, it's really hard to keep people there to, to work and, and even volunteer and get some of that uh, right off for their taxes. But uh, we, we continue to treat, keep asking the people to come and to get involved with that, but uh, we haven't had anybody yet that, that has volunteered down there. So. Hi, uh, I concur that the, the people at the transfer station are great. They have a real positive attitude and. We really are, are very fortunate in having the, uh, the nice facility that we have. I think the majority of problem comes from people not being aware. Like, a, a simple question. If I use a spray can of paint and it's empty, where do I throw it? Um, Does so it go into, I mean, you know, this and many other questions. Similar to that, people really don't know what to do. So to echo you, we, we could use some type of education program perhaps uh, the slides that you presented tonight attached to our website for the town so that if people had questions, they could go to it, maybe answering some recycling questions. Uh, second question I have regarding the dump is the, or the transfer station, is the, I'm gonna call it the recycling center because I don't know what it's really called. The section that's open from like the beginning of May till the end of September where people bring items. Gift shop. Gift shop. I'm sorry, yeah. gift shop. Okay. I know in Howard's they call it the treasure chest and it's, it's very popular. Um, the one thing I found about the gift shop is if you bring something there to leave it, it disappears right away uh, and then it's for sale somewhere like on eBay. Or, well, only if I think we should pay staff to run it, rather than counting on volunteers. And if we pay people to run the gift shop, shop, then I think we would have more continuity and have people there all the time. Thank you. And keep it more organized. Well, I, I just want to say that my, my understanding over the years is that the, 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 the main goal of the gift shop is to keep things out of the trash. And, and we honestly, I mean, I can't speak for Tom or for Josh, but we, we honestly don't care if people take it and put it in their own garage sale or whatever. It's being kept out of the trash. And I think you'd have a hard time getting staff, paid staff, getting the town to agree to, to pay staff to do that. Well, to me, the concept of the recycling is reusable. Sure. And I think that's why, for example, I had 
something. I know you can't do it. That's why I'm going to say this. Let's say you had a nice couch. And I wanted to bring it down there and leave it there. And someone in town could use it, I'm sure. And you can't do that because we can't recycle. I'd like to see something. Maybe it's too grandiose for, for what we do. Or maybe we can't do that type of thing. But I think it would be helpful. I think people, I think it would be a win-win situation. I know that the town of Howard has done it for years and it's become so popular that you can't even go into the town of Howard treasure chest if you don't live in Howard anymore. So I mean, I, th I just think recycle, reuse, and maybe I'm, my mindset's in the wrong way. And I don't mean to be critical, but I think it's important. If you have a couch, you should check call Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, they have a say. great restore program. They just took a great uh, chair from us and came and got it, picked it up, and tried to reuse. And, and this is, um, Bill, this, this is one of the main reasons we had this event tonight. That th this is the time for you to ask, what do I do with? Um, Josh is the first person you should ask. Um, we have a poster out there that literally says, where do I recycle, question mark. Um, and yeah. the, the Habitat for Humanity Restore is a perfect place that will take upholstered furniture and appliances yeah, and all kinds of things that our gift shop just, just can't handle. It's, it's like in that. perfect condition. It'll stay there. Good condition. <laughs> um, there's a couple more things I want to say and, and then I'll stop. Um, I, I just want to say that um, single stream is moving. Carrie promised me. <laughs> so it's, it's not that it's just completely stopped. You know, it was backed up terribly for a while. It is moving now. Um, also, as I just said, this is your opportunity to ask Josh, Josh about any item. Um, if, if we, he doesn't know the answer, we will find the answer and get back to you. Just, just let us know how to reach you. Um, the transfer station brochure has a whole lot of information, guys, yeah. about, about what they will take and, and if there's a fee, if not, where you can place it at the transfer station. And we've got a bunch of them right out there on the table. And finally, you've probably noticed a whole bunch of posters. Uh, boat shrink wrap recycling, um, you know, all the, all the various questions I mentioned. Um, styrofoam, plastic bottle ban, water bottle stations, um, hazardous waste collection. It's too much for you to remember, but if you have smartphones, take a picture of each one and look at it when you have time because there's a whole lot of information out there. Thanks. I have one more, just as you were saying that, I was thinking the, um, the town warrant is just going out and I, I know it's too late for this year, but I don't know why we couldn't add a page or two at the end next year. Everybody who goes and gets one of those and it will tell all the things about the dump and when you're sitting there and it's not the article you're interested in and you've got nothing to do, you might look in the back and read about, oh, that's where I, um, what I do with that kind of trash. So it's a way to get the word out to everybody um, at one time, particularly right before the summer season starts. Yeah, and, and just um, just so you know, too, on that, in our transfer station brochure that we just updated, um, we have these over at the gate shack. It actually has a little chart, um, and in each little column there, it lists you know the designated area on where the item would go. And um, in case you're ever in doubt, don't ever be afraid to stop by the guard shack and and inquire, and if it's something that they can't answer, if I'm there, I'd be more than, more than happy to help. Just a quick question on batteries, uh, AA, AAA, CD batteries, flashlight batteries, and also where do you put the spray can, the paint spray can that, that's all used up? Okay, so the, um, I'll start with the spray paint can because I was asked first. Um, with that, if it's empty, we can put that in with the tin can collection, um, is, you know, but you'd want to remove the plastic cap uh, the plastic cap, some of them may have the recyclable label on them. If they do, it's fine to put it in with the plastic. If not, then it would go in the trash. Um, as far as those batteries go, um, in the light bulb shed, it's kind of the battery light bulb shed. We separate those. Um, any of the ones, obviously, that um, are qualified through the, uh, we have two different companies um, uh, that actually deal with those, whether it's a larger battery or a smaller battery. We actually have to tape those up box them up, and then send them back to the vendor. Yeah, and that's fluorescent light bulbs as well, Josh, and the light bulb shed? Yep, light bulbs. Yep, fluorescents are the same. Uh, another company comes in for that. Um, you know, we have to categorize them by the size that's in there. We have the racks that are displayed inside the light bulb shed, so, you know, you'd go in, place them on, and then once we go in and have time, we'd put them right in the box accordingly, put the shipping <coughs> label on it, call the company when it's ready to be shipped out, mm -hmm. and it's on its way. 
Non-rechargeable and non-lead acid batteries as well can be thrown in the trash. So when you're talking about your AAA and stuff, as long as there's no mercury or hazardous waste in there, it can be trash. If you have a large amount of them, you can call or Google call to recycle, the number two, not spelled out to, uh, dot org, and they will actually give you a shipping box and ship it for free, and they'll take it back and recycle them for you. And those are for the non-hazardous, non-things that go in that universal waste shed with your your uh, CFLs and your fluorescent lights and things like that. I don't know if I heard it correctly. I know where lithium batteries go, but the AAA and the AA? Trash. Okay, that's what I've been doing. Uh, does China Recyclables push home composting? Yeah. What, what was the question again? Does Chatham Recyclables push home composting? Um, well, we actually have the home composting well, I use the bins. Online. Yeah, okay, so, so, yeah, so you have them, okay. Um, so we do actually uh, provide those for purchase there. So if, if, um, if that's something that anybody would, would ask for or need, we do sell those there at the transfer station. And, that is a good incentive for any homeowner that wants to go forth and use those. I have a question off of that. Is your compost like industrial compost? So like those like forks and cups that are like compostable? No. Yeah. no. It's a step in the right direction. <laughs> Anybody else? You all hungry? You didn't eat before you came. All right, well, thank you for coming. Here's my cards if you guys, I still have some in my office, so you can take one or none or five or ten. If you folks have any other questions, I'll start. If you have any other questions about individual items, um, you can email via chatterrecycles.org. Uh, we get emails from people all the time to say about specific things. Thank you so much for coming. You can always stop by and ask at the transfer station too. Any one of us will be gladly to help you.